Okay, welcome everybody. I think everybody's here. I'm going to make a start on this relatively quick webinar, I think, in which I'm going to just outline and highlight some of the recent functionality that's been added to the latest version of Data Viewer. And hopefully there'll be some time at the end for questions. Oops. There we go, sorry about that. So this is just a rough outline of what we'll be covering in this webinar. I'm gonna start off just as a sort of refresher, talk a very little bit about the kind of basics for, of Data Viewer for those of you who may not be familiar with it, um, just to sort of cover the, the main functionality areas and how it works and the, the contents really of the data files that the Eileen Kai Tracker systems save. And then the bulk of the webinar will focus on these following topics, which are all relatively recent additions in the last or last couple of updates we've made to Data Viewer. So I'm going to talk about aggregate mode and running aggregate reports, creating uh, fixation maps, particularly difference maps, also known as heat maps. I'm going to talk a bit about some of the interest area manipulation tools that have been added in the last, the latest version, which are very useful, and perhaps focus most on time series or binning reports, which are useful not just for visual world tasks, as we'll see, but for a, a variety of other research scenarios. And then I'll talk a bit about uh, interest period creation and uh, creating multiple interest periods and running reports that cover multiple interest periods. And then finally, at the end, I'll talk a bit about uh, event editing, which is another area of functionality that's been added to Data Viewer that is going to be useful, I think, in some scenarios. Um, <clears throat> I thought I'd start just with this slide. It's a slide I used at a a little training talk I gave at uh, the ECEM workshop, just showing a timeline. But I'm showing it now just to point out that Data Viewer has been around, it must be 15 years now, which is uh, quite a long time. And over that time, I've watched it evolve and become more and more powerful. And uh, today, we're just going to talk about some of the, the latest additions to that. But uh, back in the day, before Data Viewer, eye tracking analysis was a very, very long and arduous task, uh, literally involving at one point in my career measuring things with a ruler, and then that was sort of digitized on a digital pad. Anyway, right. Um, this is a list of some of the things that have been added to Data Viewer 3.1, which is a sort of major version shift for us from Data Viewer 2. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm just going to highlight some of them. For example, things like these interest area manipulations and um, other things like that. So to just do some quick background and a quick recap, Data Viewer is designed to load in EDF files, iLink data files, which are the files that are saved by iLink eye trackers. And it's worth just remembering or reminding ourselves of what the actual content of those EDFs is. The EDF files themselves are binary files. They are openable only really with Data Viewer. You can, however, use our EDF to ASCII tool to convert the binary EDF files into readable ASCII data. And if you do that and then take a look at the contents of the EDF files, you will see that they comprise mainly of this, which is a mixture of samples, which you can see very clearly. Samples have got, if you've done a monocular recording, just four columns. The first column is a timestamp. The second column is the X pixel location of the gaze cursor or the gaze. Uh, the third column is the Y location of gaze. So this is X and Y for where the person was looking. And the final column is simply pupil size, pupil area, typically in some arbitrary units. And if you want to find out more about the pupil area measure, you can watch the webinar I did recently on pupilometry, which goes into that particular metric <clears throat> in a lot of detail. So we have samples, and samples are, if you like, the kind of lowest level of data that we have. We have one sample for every 
um, frame every image that the eye tracker took of your eye. So if you're sampling at a thousand hertz, you will have one sample per millisecond. This data you can see is counting up in twos. So we have um, 500 hertz data, the data every two uh, sample every two milliseconds. Interspersed with the samples are these things, events, <clears throat> which always come in pairs, as we will see. So here we have an end saccade event followed by a start fixation event. And you will also see occasionally these things, which are messages. Again, they have a timestamp and a message. Everything has a timestamp, which is important because it allows us to find out when things happened within the data. So samples in their simplest form contain time, X and Y in screen pixels, and pupil size in arbitrary units. Depending on what options you check when you do convert to ASCII, you can have some extra columns which contain things like which could contain things like uh, the resolution data, which is pixels per degree. So at that point on the screen, how many pixels per degree of visual angle are there? These are quite useful for turning pixel gaze data back into or into visual angle data. You can also have a column which has got the eye's velocity at that point, and also a column that has the status of the parallel port pins on your host computer. For example, if you're synchronizing your eye tracking recording with uh, EEG or any other kind of recording device, having the ability to know the status of those ports on a sample by sample level can be quite useful. It's worth pointing out here that if there are missing samples, for example, here the person clearly starts to blink, they are represented as dots, not zeros or anything else, but dots. And um, you'll find, for example, one of the things that you can do in Data Viewer when you run a sample report is replace those dots with something that's slightly more friendly to, for example, R or MATLAB or other analysis software, such as NAs or NANs, so that um, they don't complain when they see these dots. Events, as I said, always come in pairs. So here we have an end fixation event followed by a start saccade event. Here we have the end saccade event followed by a start fixation event. And again, I just want to explain briefly why that is for those of you that aren't aware. It's because the iLink host software uses a saccade detecting approach. It basically uses velocity and acceleration criteria to determine at what point the eye is in a saccade. It's very easy to know when the eye is in a saccade if you have a high sampling rate. So very, very rapidly within two or three samples, velocity of the eye will go above, say, 30 degrees per second. And at that point, you can signal the onset of a saccade. So whereas many eye trackers work by trying to define fixations as temporal windows of relative stability where the eye isn't drifting around too much and velocity isn't too high. Eyelink systems do it the other way around. They define saccades, which are fairly unambiguous because nothing in the human body can move as fast as the eye moves. Um, and by defining a saccade, a fixation is defined by default. So the reason this fixation here ended is because we detected the start of a saccade. And the reason this fixation started here is because we detected the end of a saccade. So fixations are not saccades. And this saccade detecting approach allows us to parse truly tiny, small fixations, which exist. You know, we, it's known that fixations can be 5, 10, 20 milliseconds long quite happily. But if you have some criteria like the fixation must be at least 50 milliseconds, you're going to miss these little fixations. But with a saccade picking approach, you don't do that. You'll notice that when an event ends, you get some extra information. So when a fixation ends, you get the time at which it started, the time at which it ends, its duration in milliseconds, the average X and Y location of gaze over the duration of that fixation and the average pupil size. And when a saccade ends, you get the start time, the end time, the duration in milliseconds. X and Y at the beginning, let's match these two up here. X and Y at the end of the saccade, 
match these two down here. And the amplitude of the saccade and its peak velocity in degrees of visual angle per second. Um, so that is the basic content of an EDF file, but it can be supplemented with these messages. And these really are critical. Some of these messages will be written automatically, perhaps by your experimental software. But if you want to be able to analyze your data at a sophisticated level in data viewer, it's really worth getting to grips with these special messages, not just the messages that flag critical trial events like stimulus onset, fixation offset, or fixation cross offset, response, things like that. It's definitely important that you flag those with messages in your trial, otherwise you're not going to be able to... Um, oh, somebody's just joined, hi there. <laughs> you're not going to be able to map up your gaze data with the um, events that occurred. So you're not going to know how soon after a stimulus appeared, a fixation was made, for example, if you don't have these kinds of messages flagging when things happened in your trial. But other messages, generally messages that have this exclamation mark V in front of them, are messages that Data Viewer itself uses in order to make your life easier when it comes to analyzing your data in Data Viewer. And it's worth bearing in mind that if, for example, you did a study where you showed a series of faces to people, when you open that EDF file in Data Viewer, you will see those faces behind the gaze. We'll see in a minute. But that will only happen if you sent a message such as this one, which tells Data Viewer where to go and find that image so that it can display it. The images themselves or the text or the videos or whatever your stimuli were that you presented during your task aren't stored in the EDF file itself. The EDF file stores gaze, events, I mean samples, events and messages. Some of those messages can be useful messages which will tell Data Viewer or any other analysis software where to go to find the stimuli that were shown and when to show them if you like. But the stimuli themselves aren't in the EDF. And I only mention this because rather a common problem that occurs is when people copy their data from one computer and onto another, perfectly natural thing to do. You want to go and analyze your data at home or in your office. And often people just copy the EDF files, thinking that the EDF files will have everything that they need. They don't. They only have samples, events, and messages. If you don't also copy the rest of your experimental folder, when you load that data into Data Viewer, Data Viewer is not going to be able to follow those links and find the images, and you will end up with gaze displayed over a black background, essentially. So that's worth bearing in mind. So that's really just a, a brief bit of revision for people who aren't particularly familiar with data viewer or the sort of low level contents of iLink data files. And um, I thought I'd go over that just in case there are any people watching the webinar who aren't particularly familiar with data viewer. What we will do now, oh, that was the point that I just made, is that you don't have in the EDF things like your interest areas, um, the images, the stimuli that were shown. You just have these pointers messages that tell data viewer where to go. Okay, so to start the webinar proper, I'm going to talk a bit about trial grouping, which I talked a bit about in the original webinar on data viewer, but it's, um, it's very, very useful. And I think many people aren't quite aware of how powerful it is. And it's very, very useful when it's used in combination with aggregate mode, which was added in a relatively recent upgrade to data viewer, as were the aggregate reports. And I'm going to talk a bit about how to use aggregate mode, when you might want to use it, and when you might want to generate aggregate reports. Um, trial grouping, as I've said, is, is very, very useful, but it is most useful if at the beginning or when you at the outset of designing your experiment, you made sure to include variables such as condition or 
duration or whatever it is that you might subsequently want to be able to group your data on at the analysis stage. I mean, essentially any sort of variable that may ever feature in a statistical analysis that you might think about doing, you want to be available to data viewer so that you can group your data by that variable and explore the gaze, explore the data in that way. Um, if, like me and many other people, it suddenly occurs to you after the event that something might be a relevant variable, for example, participant gender, maybe something that you didn't think to encode as you ran the experiment, but after the act after you've collected some data you think hmm, it might be interesting to be actually be able to split my participants on whether they were male or female but you haven't got that encoded as a variable anyway in your script but it's very easy in data viewer to add variables afterwards and again if you're interested in learning how to do this i suggest watching the uh, original data viewer webinar where i go through that in some detail um, I'm going to switch out of this presentation now and talk a bit about or start using data viewer. I've got two viewing sessions here and um, I will let's get rid of that heat map. I will explain a bit about the experiments and they're not real ex well they're sort of pseudo experiments. It's this part of data that I collected or a student of mine collected quite some time ago. And again, if you um, saw the original data viewer webinar, you'll be familiar with this. But essentially, this is a little subset of an experiment where people saw a series of faces. And the faces were either um, black and white or color, and they were expressing an emotion, which was either fear, anger, surprise, I think, happiness. And I think somewhere there's some neutral ones. Oops, and even an upside down one. So when you import your data files into Data Viewer, by default, your data will be grouped like this with the grouping nodes being the participants themselves. So each one of these is a different participant and underneath the participant or clustered underneath the grouping node of the participant are all of the trials that participant performed. Let's get rid of these heat maps. Um, whoops. So if we go to our trial variable manager, you will see, I'm just going to rename that, that we have a number of variables. These were all variables that I included when I wrote the script. So one of the variables that could change over trials was the emotion being displayed, and the other was the type, which is literally whether it's black or white or not. And we can choose so instead of grouping our data by participant, we can now start to do some more useful grouping. For example, we could group by emotion. Let's see what happens. So now we see angry, I was wrong about surprise, fear, happy, it must have been an angry face, neutral. And if we look at all of these faces they are in all indeed neutral and if we look at all of the faces or the trials sorry clustered underneath happiness we can see that they are all indeed happy and there's a few upside down ones that i put in to illustrate something later on so we can group data but what happens if we go into aggregate mode? At the moment, you can see if we click on one of these happy trials, we're just looking at one person's data. But if we click on aggregate mode, just give it a few seconds because it's having to go and aggregate data over lots of trials, you can see all of a sudden we can view everybody's data at once. Now, there's rather a lot of trials, rather a lot of people looked at a happy face. So one of the things I'm gonna do is group by emotion and by type. 
and you'll now see that we have more nodes. We have angry color and angry grayscale. And again, if I look at the angry color ones, these should all be angry and in color, whereas the angry grayscale ones are angry and in grayscale. And again, we can look at an individual's data. If I turn off aggregate mode, that's just one person's data. Or if I turn on aggregate mode, you see everybody's data clustered underneath that grouping node. So that's one thing that's useful about aggregate mode. The other thing is useful is that you can then do these kinds of B-swarm playbacks. Now, this isn't a particularly uh, relevant experiment for these kinds of B-swarm things because people only saw a face for a very short period of time. But for example, if you look at the webinar I did on working with dynamic stimuli, you will see that these B-swarm playback views can be very, very helpful because you can use trial coloring. So you can color um, all of the grayscale people one color, all of the so all of the grayscale trials one color, all of the color trials different color, and then play back and it would be clear where or if there was any separation in where people were looking, depending on whether they were looking at as color or a grayscale thing. So this works much more sensibly when you have dynamic stimuli videos, for example, that people have watched, where you can watch these bee swarms of different colored cursors and see the points at which all of the red cursors head off to one part of the video and the blue cursors stay on a different part, for example. You can also use, let's go back to our original um, grouping, and just group on participants. So aggregate mode still works in this point. So now we have all of this participants trials aggregated, all of the fixations they made across all of the um, 96 odd trials that they made. And you can see that people have got slightly different styles, for example. Let's have a look at the uh, first 1000 seconds, 1000 milliseconds. You can see that person focusing very much on the eyes, that person looking more to the right eye than to the left eye with lots of fixations on the nose. So you can see these kinds of things and you can play back with these dynamic heat maps. It makes it very clear that that person within the first 1000 milliseconds favors the right, the left eye, sorry, whereas this person is definitely favoring the right eye. So aggregate mode not only allows you to view things in this trial overlay view, when you can see data from more than one trial or across more than one participant if you're grouping via condition, it also allows you to create these dynamic heat maps in the playback mode. Um, the one place where aggregate mode doesn't make any difference is in this kind of temporal view mode, which will only show you one person's data at a time. So it will only show you the trial that you've highlighted here. Even in aggregate mode, it's not gonna show you lots and lots of spidery traces. It, it just wouldn't make much sense, basically. So that's aggregate mode. It's very useful for creating these kind of um, viewing scenarios where you can quickly get an overview of your data. But you can also, once you've grouped your data, run these aggregate reports. So let's group just by emotion to begin with. So we now have our four emotions and a little collection of upside down trials. These I only put in because I wanted to show you, and I'll, I'll show you later when we do interest area manipulations. I don't want them in my report because I'm only really interested in these emotions. So I could do two things. I could either right click and remove them from the viewing session, which would remove them permanently and they would not be included in any report. Or I can check this rather useful little option here, exclude from reports. So now my report is only going to contain angry, fear, happy, and neutral. And I could run one of these aggregate reports. And I'm gonna run the event statistics report first and take a look at it in Excel. 
so you can see what it's got. And then um, after I've created some interest areas, we will run an aggregate interest area report as well. So let's take a look at the aggregate event statistics report. Um, I should say, if anybody has questions at any point, I think you can kind of raise your hand in GoToMeeting. And if you do, I'll try and uh, glance over to my little panel every now and then and, um, and do my best to answer them. Um, or if you prefer, you can wait until the end of the session and uh, ask questions then. So we're going to ignore upside down faces. What happens when we run an aggregate event statistics? I think of this as a kind of aggregate trial report, really. It's a kind of report that's going to give you some very, very basic but potentially useful summary statistics. But rather than just have one row per trial, it's now going to have essentially one row per grouping node. So it's a very, very quick way to sort of collapse data across any variable of interest within your um, experiment. So by default, the report is going to give you the trial group, in other words, which one of these and which grouping variable you've used. Um, and you could look at some useful things like the fixation count, the average fixation duration, um, we've got saccade count, there we go, average saccade amplitude, and some other interesting things, for example, visited interest area counts, we haven't got any interest areas yet, so that's not going to be much use, pupil size, that might be quite interesting, um, maybe even blink count, all collapsed across our variable. So let's create this report. Data Viewer often prompts you to save your viewing session before running a report. I learnt my lesson from the first webinar and I massively trimmed down the number of trials. This was actually a much bigger experiment originally with uh, I think 200 and something trials per participant but I kind of halved it. So now it's asking you where do you want or what do you want to call this report. So we'll call this aggregate event report um, and we'll remind ourselves that we were just grouping on emotion so that report then gets generated and if we go to my so the, the analysis folder is on my desktop and you can see that having saved it, it automatically creates an output folder. And in there is the report we just created. And if we open that in Excel, Excel moans. But here you can see quite clearly, it's a very simple report. There's our four grouping nodes. There's the grouping variable, which was in motion. And here is things like fixation count, fixation duration average, mean, to cake out pupil size. <clears throat> Interesting difference there with fear faces having a smaller pupil size. Um, and blink count. So there we are in a very quick way to generate something that allows you to just get a sense of whether there may be anything interesting in your data that you might want to go and pull out in more detail and do proper statistics on, for example. Now let's close that and let me just show you why or how great the sort of grouping can be so useful and powerful. We did that once, grouping just on our emotion variable, but we could also, if we go back to trial grouping, add type, regroup our data. If we generate exactly the same report again, an aggregate event statistics report, use the same variables, make data viewer happy by saving your viewing session. Some reports it seems to let you um, create without saving, although it gets a bit cross and tells you that it's going to tell you, ask you to save it later. But other reports it seems to insist that you save um, the, the viewing session first, and this is one of them.
So if we now remind ourselves that this was grouped by both emotion and type, and save that report. Let's go back to the output folder, open it in Excel. Uh, I forgot to, when you regroup data, it can, it will lose um, your exclusion. So I forgot to exclude those, but they have no data anyway. So here you can see we now have angry color, angry grayscale, fear color, fear grayscale, etc., etc. And our data has now been aggregated over those grouping variables rather than just emotion. So the point is, is that you can be infinitely flexible, basically. You can choose to group your data by as few or as many variables as you want in whichever order you want. And whatever you've got in your viewing session over here, in terms of how your data is grouped, that will be reflected in these aggregate reports when you have aggregate mode turned on. So that was the aggregate event statistics. I'm going to move on in a second to aggregate interest area reports. But before I do that, let's go into the part of the session where we talk about interest areas and interest area manipulation. Um, I'm just going back to my PowerPoint just to sort of remind myself of what we've got to do. So let's regroup. Oops, let's join the right webinar first. I mean, go to the right viewing session. Let's regroup our data just on participants and regroup. You can see that I have no interest areas in any of these. And if we turn it on, I'm sorry, I have one interest area, which is a very useless interest area. It simply surrounds the portion of the screen containing the face. It's not even really the right shape because it's rectangular. It would be nice to know how long people looked at the left eye, the right eye, the nose and the mouth region. Now, in many experiments, you may need to define those individually for each image, in which case you could group your data by the image that was shown and create an interest area template for one example and then apply it to the others. I took the precaution when I made this experiment of ensuring that you can see if I flick through quite quickly that everybody's eyes were pretty much aligned at the same point in the screen. Oops, see that's why I've been playing around. So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to get rid of this default interest area and all of the other interest areas that I've been uh, playing around with at various points. Now, I could just select each participant and change the default interest area set to that participant to empty, which will get rid of it. But I've got quite a lot of participants and one of the neat tricks you can do with trial grouping is create a variable for yourself that groups all of the trials. And you can do that very, very easily by clicking on trial variable manager. We're going to create a new variable for, to, for our data and we're just going to call it all trials. And we're going to give it a default value of one. If we click OK and go back to trial grouping, we now have our all trials variable. And if we regroup on that, everything is clustered under the one because we only had one value. It was the default value of one. All of our trials for all participants are now clustered under this variable, under this grouping node. And we can now apply the default interest, empty interest area set. And now it doesn't matter whose data we go on go back and regroup our data by participant. Doesn't matter whose data we click on, choose somebody down here. You can see that they have no interest areas. So that's another useful little trick for using data grouping. Um, so let's create some interest areas, which we are then going to apply to 
all of the trials again using that little trick. I'm just going to choose the first trial of my first um, participant and I'm going to create an interest area called whole face. Now you'll notice that I didn't do a particularly good job of that and that's because I want to show you that you can hold down the alt key and manipulate when you said you can't manipulate a little there we go so I can resize this using the alt key and the arrow keys so that it fits my template on my face nicely so there we go we now have one interest area called whole face I want to make some more I'm going to make another one make it quite big and call it left eye I think technically it's the person's right eye but it's, to me it's the left eye so that's what we're going to do and again I can hold down the alt key and move it now I could just drag and create another circle for the right eye but we want to make sure that any dwell time differences we've got aren't simply because one interest area was slightly bigger than the other, for example. So one thing that you can do that's quite useful with these interest areas is simply right click, copy it and then paste. Remember to relabel it right I and then again, hold down the alt key, hover over it with the mouse and we can put position it like that. So now we have whole face, left eye, right eye. Let's have a big rectangle for the mouth. Again, I think I've made that a bit too big so I can change it. But first of all, let's just reorder it. And then maybe a free form or freehand interest area for the nose, which you can do just by clicking once and clicking twice makes a line. You can do something like this. And then enter to sort of finish it off and we'll call that nose so now we have an interest area set and at the moment of course it's only for this one trial but what we can do let's click on this button here which saves the interest area set to disk it saves it as a template <clears throat> so I'll go back to my faces um, analysis session I'm going to call this um, all face interest area template or something click save data viewer will prompt you asking if you want to kind of keep that template within the session so that you can use it and the answer the good answer is yes because what I could now do is apply this template all face interest area template to all of the trials for participant 20 or even more usefully I can go back regroup my data on my all trials variable and then apply the interest area set to that grouping node which means it will be applied to all of the trials underneath it go back regroup the data in its kind of original format by participants and you'll now see that it doesn't matter which participant I click on which trial within which participant you can see that the interest area is there and is applied so I am going to talk a bit about some other kinds of manipulations you can do but before I do that I want to go back to that interest area report so let's group our data again on emotion and type so that we have let's regroup let's remind ourselves to exclude our upside down trials from reports because I'm not interested in them at this point and let's go and have a look at a aggregate interest area report again by default you're going to get your trial group whatever grouping variables were used and the interest area 
ID. But we would also like to have the interest area label because that's a bit more useful. And we can get information like dwell time, percentage. Percentage doesn't make sense because we're using a fixed um, interest period here. We can just have pure dwell time. We don't need to convert it into percentages because every participant's data that we look at in this report is going to be from 1000 milliseconds worth of data. For example, if we had a task where, I don't know, the face was displayed until somebody made a response, until somebody decided whether it was happy, angry or, or neutral, then it may be we would have an interest period that was varying in length across participants and across trials, in which case it would make sense to convert things to percentage so that we would know that on this trial that happened to last 10 seconds long, looking at the eyes for two seconds means that they spent 20% of the time there. But on a trial that spent only lasted four seconds, looking at the eyes for two seconds would be 50% of the dwell time. So that's when percentage makes sense. When you've got a fixed interest period or a fixed time window, uh, you can use the raw dwell time. Uh, what else might be interesting? Fixation count. Um, oh, these are interesting. The total number of trials. In other words, because we are now aggregating our data and running an aggregate report, we can pull out things like, well, what percentage of trials was that interest area visited in for this grouping node? So that can be quite useful. Um, trials using this area, the total number of trials. So there are various um, run count can be interesting. Revisit trial. Total number of trials with more than one run of fixations in the interest area. Okay, I'm not going to use that one. Let's quickly save the session, run that report, just so that I can show you again when you open it in Excel, rather than having, as you would in a standard interest area report, one row per interest area, per trial, per participant, we're now only going to have one row per interest area, per aggregated group, basically. So let's call this an aggregate interest area report. And again, we can remind ourselves that we're grouped on emotion and type. Save that. You can see hopefully it will go through eight groups this time because we ignored the upside down faces. Again, if I go back to my output folder, there is my aggregate interest area report. And now you can see there we have let's move that back interest area label for each group so angry color trials we have our five interest areas angry grayscale the same five interest areas so this is something that you can do from the kind of original interest area report if you um know about using pivot tables and things like that. And in fact, I think one of the webinars that I'm going to do in the next few months will be on using pivot tables because they are an incredibly useful way of parsing um, data viewer reports of any type, including aggregate reports, in fact. But um, it's, as you can see, a very, very easy way of getting an overview of your data quite quickly without having to plow through an entire interest area report. So that was an aggregate interest area report. And again, I could regroup the data in a different way. And the output would again, if I ran the report again, it would reflect how my data has been grouped over here on the left. So we've created some interest areas. We've saved them as a template and we've applied that template to all of the trials in the experiment using the little trick of creating a new variable, giving us a default value of one. Um, I now want to show you some of the functionality that's been added recently that um, to Data Viewer 3 specifically, that I think is quite useful. And again, I'm just going to resort the data quickly just so that we are working on 
the first trial of the first participant. Let's, for example, imagine that all of a sudden we decided, well, it seems silly to have that whole face so tightly drawn around the face because people who are fixating here were probably looking at the face or close to it. There may have been some slight inaccuracy in the recording or their gaze or the calibration model or what have you. So let's increase the size of that. Now we could directly edit these values here. So we could change the pixel values of the interest area itself, but that's somewhat difficult. What's a lot easier is if you right click and choose interest area shape actions. There's two things you can do. You can either resize the edges, in which case you can resize them individually. So I might decide that I want to go out 20 pixels on the left and the right, but only 10 pixels on the top and the bottom. And click OK. So you can see there that it's expanded it more on the left and the right than it has on the top of the bottom or the bottom. Or right click interest area shape actions resize I could resize as a percentage so if I want to increase it by 25% I would type in 125 and click OK so if I wanted to decrease it again let's go to oops, interest area shape actions resize by if I wanted to decrease it by 25% I'd put in 75 that should get us back to where we were and it does so you can see very very quick ways of um, resizing interest areas I could choose two interest areas at the same time and decide that I want to make both of those bigger and again interest area shape actions resize by Let's make them 5% bigger. So now we've resized both of them. That was slightly too big because it's now overlapping with my nose, which I don't really want to do. Another thing you can do if I, you decide that you want to change something, if we click on the nose, you can see each of these points can be kind of individually dragged. So I could just reshape my nose interest area that way whoops I don't think I'm drawing it again go back there um, I seem to have added a point somehow um, anyway that's an example of how you can use these interest area shape actions to um, resize interest areas should you want to. You could even reshape the mouth one using the same actions. Oops, I still thinks <laughs> I'm drawing an interest area. That was what I was supposed to click on to stop it doing that. Um, so let's try and do my whole face a bit better. I want to expand it up more than out. Um, resize the edges. Let's expand the left by 10 right by 10 and the top and the bottom by 20 and that should get us back to having everything 20 all round there so of course now if i want to apply this to all of the other trials i can again save it call it all face interest area template larger so that we know what we're doing Go regroup our data on our all trials variable. Click on the grouping node, go down to the default interest area set property, and now apply it to all of our trials. We can regroup our data back to the default setting of per participant, and you can see it doesn't matter who I select, the bigger expanded interest area set has been applied. So now we finally get to the point of those upside down faces. If I go back to my trial grouping and group by emotion, you will notice we have a few trials 
where the face was upside down. This really I just put in sort of to um, to demonstrate. I'm just going to get rid of the interest area set. So wouldn't it be nice if we could take our existing interest area set and just flip it, which is exactly what we've done to our faces, so that we can apply it to that. And that's exactly what we can do. We can click on a trial, go down to the interest area set, choose our larger one, and select all of them. Right click, shape actions, flip vertical, and there we go. It's flipped all of them vertically. Now my interest areas match my upside down face. And of course, we could now save this as a template and call it template larger upside down. Save that and now apply it to all of my upside down trials. Now you could imagine a scenario in which you had, for example, faces that had been rotated. Well, in fact, if you're just using natural faces, often faces aren't perfectly horizontally aligned. So you may want to actually kind of take this template and rotate rather than flip. So rotate everything by an angle. Now, you might think, OK, that's easy. I'm just going to grab all of those and then choose rotate. But you'll notice two things. One is that you can't rotate by an angle. And the other is, is if you rotate by 90 degrees, it's kind of counterintuitive. Rather than rotating the whole group by 90 degrees, it rotates each of the individual interest areas. That's actually not counterintuitive, it's intuitive. It rotates each of the interest areas by 90 degrees. So I'm going to undo that. Rotate left by 90 and we get back to it. So how would we rotate this interest area set by a set number of degrees? Well, in order to do the rotation maths, um, data viewer needs these interest areas, which are currently ellipses and a rectangle, to be converted into freeform, freehand interest areas. That way it has specific pair points that it can do the maths on. So we can choose the left eye and the right eye. Um, again, if we go back to our interest area shape actions, one of the things we can do is convert to freehand. You'll see the ellipses now have a number of points on them, which is what's going to allow data viewer to do these kind of complex rotations. The nose is already a free hand, the mouth isn't, oops, and the whole face aren't, isn't either. So again, convert to freehand. Now, again, if I click on all of these and right click and go to interest area shape actions, you now see we can rotate by angle. And I could put in, for example, 45 degrees. But again, if I do that, what's going to happen is each individual interest area is going to be rotated by 45 degrees. That's not what we want. We want to, to rotate the entire set of interest areas by 45 degrees. And the way we do that is, again, interest area shape actions. Oops. And sorry, we don't need to go there. We just link here. And what you may notice if you look carefully is you see these little lines that kind of tie all of the interest areas together. And now you see we only have one linked interest area set. And if I rotate by angle, put in 45 degrees, you can see the whole set of interest areas gets rotated by 45 degrees. And there are a whole host of scenarios in which this is very, very useful, not just face processing, but various visual search tasks and things like that, where you've got things that may be in various formats or various angles or, or rotations. Um, I'm going to undo that. Don't forget, one of the things that Data Viewer doesn't do very well is um, undo. And in fact, if I try and press Control Z, for example, nothing's going to happen. But you can generally get away with things by sort of doing the opposite of what you just did. So if I click back on Rotate by Angle, put in 45 degrees again, but this time 
click rotate left, you find that the interest areas all go back to where they should be. So that's interest area manipulation. I'm just gonna check that I've done everything. Yep, rotated interest areas and link them. Okay, so in the last um, 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk quickly about time series analyses. These are, I'll flip back to the presentation for a second. Um, these are often the type of analysis or the type of report that you need in order to do a statistical analysis on visual world type tasks where you hear a sentence unfold over time. In this particular experiment, the data that we're gonna be looking at, there were sentences of the form, the dog hated the shark at the boxing match because he, and what the experimenter was interested in is where are people looking when they hear the word he? Because in the English language, the word he at this point in the sentence processing is ambiguous. It could be he the dog hated the shark because he the dog hated everybody, or it could be he the dog hated the shark because he the shark was a horrible shark. So some verbs will bias you towards an MP1 interpretation, in other words, towards thinking that he refers to the dog. Other verbs will bias you towards an MP2 interpretation. In other words, he would be biased towards, you'd be biased towards thinking he referred to the shark. And the question that was being asked in this experiment was, can we find any evidence that as these sentences unfold, the nature of the verb itself biases people towards one or other interpretation. In other words, are they more likely to be looking at the dog or the shark at around the time they hear the word he, having been given an MP1 biasing verb or an MP2 bias biasing verb? Um, that's a classic kind of visual world type task, and that's the kind of data that we're going to look at. Um, and I'm going to show you how to sort of answer that question, if you like, relatively straightforwardly by creating and in a time series or binning report from within data viewer. Um, so that's just an example of the kind of data that you'd be used to looking, but it, the data like that isn't very helpful. It's not showing you how gaze unfolded over time. It's showing you where people looked at over the entire course of the trial. That's not what you want. What you want is some kind of temporal information in there. And that's what these time series binning reports are gonna give you. As we said, they're not just useful for um, visual world type tasks. I find these time series reports incredibly useful for research with dynamic stimuli, again, videos, anything where stuff is unfolding over time. Um, these can be very, very useful. And also actually for pupillometry where you can use it as a sort of quick way of downsampling your data really. Pupil size changes are relatively slow, but you, still need sample level data, but rather than have a report that's got one sample every millisecond or every two millisecond, you can do a binning report and bin your data down to 50 millisecond bins or something like that. It makes it a lot easier to then deal with the numbers subsequently. So let's flip to the other viewing session, which is my visual world task. Again, just to show you what it looked like to begin with, we have a number of participants, 16, all of whom did 36 trials. Half of those trials involved listening to a sentence that had a verb that biased you towards the first noun phrase, and the other half of trials had a verb that biased you towards the second one. In each trial, there were two animals, one of which was MP1, one of which was MP2. Um, some kind of prepositional image. So the sentences would continue. So the, the dolphin loved the sheep in the exam or something like that. I'm not sure what that image is. There'd be something that would basically try and get gaze off either of these two. So that at the point where you, you then heard the word because he, you'd have to go to one of them. You wouldn't already be on one of them. That was the purpose. And the other final image would be a complete distractor image. So if we look at the interest area sets, you can see we have MP1. That was badly labeled. That's my fault for messing around with these. It's fine one where they're not badly made, labeled. 
MP1 was a sheep, MP2 was a dolphin, the prepositional phrase was that picture and the distractor was a necklace which had nothing to do with anything that was said in the sentence. So having set or having got our interest areas nicely labelled, the next thing we need to do is set some kind of temporal window. Now if we look at the full trial period and again just select a random person's data, you will see we have a range of messages, one of which comes in at the point at which the sound file starts playing, and we have other little messages marking various points as the sentence unfolds, such as noun phrase one onset, verb onset, so that would be the sheep, hated, the dolphin, in the exam, or whatever, or the library, I'm not sure what that image was supposed to be showing. Um, Subclause, because he, and now that's really what we're interested in. So we could create a time series report for the whole trial, and I will do that, or at least from the point at which the sound file started. But let's, yeah, let's do that first, actually. And in fact, you can see that I have created an interest period which goes from the message that said play sound to the message that says display question. If we go back to our data, you'll see that after the sentence is unfolded, the, the next thing that happens is there's a comprehension question, which we're not interested in. Um, if we play back the trial, you might see the comprehension question at the end. Oh, no. Anyway, we're not interested in the question, so we can use that as the end message. So I've created an interest period called just images, which basically is from when the sound file started playing to when the uh, question or to when the trial ended, essentially. I've just noticed there's no data there, so I'm just going to go and check. Play sound, display question. I oh, want my data gone. Hold on one second. Play sound. Oh, I'm in the wrong mode, aren't I? There it is. Sorry, that confused me for a while. I was in playback view. I should have been in overlay view. So here we have, you can see people sampling all of the images, but more focusing on the MP1 and the MP2, not sure which is which. The question is, can we find any evidence for there being a biasing effect of these verbs? So we can create, having selected our interest period, a times course binning report. And before we do that, let me just show you one very useful trick. In the preferences section, check the option that says Cyclopean mode. The reason for this is because if you're doing a standard visual world type task, or in fact, to be honest, if you're doing 95% of any kind of eye tracking, the chances are that you're going to be doing monocular recordings. And you may, as a rule, be recording from people's right eye or their left eye, whatever your preference is. But there's always the odd occasion where, for whatever reason, you record from the left eye instead of the right eye. Maybe they were wearing glasses and you just got a better signal from the left eye. Maybe they turned out to have a very, very lazy right eye, so you recorded the left eye. Um, for whatever reason, you will end up with data files, some of which have data for a left eye, some of which have data for a right eye. And when it comes to running a report, such as a sample report or a time series report, you don't want to have to think, oh, do I want Am I going to have to grab all of the left variables, which are going to be empty for most of my participants, as well as all of the right variables? If you use this little trick of checking Cyclopean mode, what it means is when it comes to running the report, you can use these average variables. And what that means is that whichever I was recorded, that is the data that will be shown. And there are lots and lots of potentially 
interesting variables. And I'm literally just going to choose two of them. I'm going to choose my variable, which is condition, which is telling me whether, let's go back a bit. Let's group our data on my condition variable and you can see what it's doing. You can see trials were either noun phrase one biasing, noun phrase two biasing, or practice trials, which I'm not interested in. So I'm going to exclude them from the reports. I could even, if I wanted, delete them from the whole viewing session. Um, but what I want is to see whether we have any difference between these noun MP1 biasing and MP2 biasing trials. And now we have my condition variable, and I'm going to choose this one, the average interest area star, star being for whatever interest area you've got, sample count percentage. In other words, for each bin, for each interest area, what is the proportion of gaze across all of the participants who looked or who we have trials for at this time window, what is the proportion of gaze that was in this interest area? This is the basis of a time series analysis. That is your raw data. You can choose your bin interval. 20 milliseconds is fairly standard, but you could do 50 or 10, whatever you want. And importantly, at least for this task, I've put in my interest area labels, because you may have been noticed if you were watching carefully, that one of the things I didn't do when I wrote this experiment was do a sensible thing of mapping interest area IDs to types. In other words, ID1 should always be noun phrase 1, no matter where it is, and ID2 should always be noun phrase 2, no matter where it is. I was kind of, uh, this is an old experiment of mine from a long time ago, and I kind of did it the other way around where ID1 was always top left. So ID1, interest area with an ID of one could be the noun phrase one, noun phrase two, the distractor or anything. But luckily, the noun phrase one was always labeled noun phrase one, noun phrase two was always labeled noun phrase two. So I always have these consistent labels. I can put them in and data viewer is sensible enough to disregard, if you like, the fact that my interest area IDs don't map up neatly with my interest area labels. There are various options that I'm not going to talk much about. It, you need to sort of choose these based presumably on the kind of dominant tech method or practice, if you like, in your field. But in general, I think it makes sense to include, and these are the defaults, to include in your calculation of the proportion samples that were on screen. In other words, not samples that may have been gathered when people sort of looked down to the keyboard or gazed up at the sky or anything like that. Um, and you may choose to exclude samples during saccades in the calculation of where gaze was. To be honest, none of these are going to make a huge amount of difference. Now, this is the critical thing. Don't forget, check, create a separate report collapsing data across all trials in the same group. We have two groups included and I ignored one and that's what we want we want to be very quickly able to see do we have any difference in how gaze unfolds across the mp1 trials versus the mp2 trials you can think about it as creating a kind of aggregate version of this time series binning report so all we've got is the default report variables and I've just added my own one condition so we know whether we're in the mp1 or mp2 and this one, the percentage of gaze or samples that are in that inf interest area for that bin. Again, a uh, data viewer will ask us to save the session. And after we've saved the session, I can now create a time series binning report. And I'm going to call this, um, you can see I've done it already, <laughs> whole trial. Let's just overwrite it. And here it's creating the collapse one. If we go back to the output folder and look at this collapsed data, again, Excel will moan a bit, you can see that I have grouping index of one, 
scroll down a bit more for all of the noun phrase one trials or bins and then two for all of the noun phrase two and here we have five columns interest area one two three four and zero don't forget in standard visual world analysis interest area zero is just everything that isn't one of the other interest areas so it's the null interest area if you like and to plot our data i'm just going to grab this oops so here we've got all of the mp1 data so i'm not interested in <clears throat> where people are looking not at the interest areas. I want to look at how gaze to each of my four interest areas unfolded over time. And I can do that very quickly, by inserting a little line graph. <clears throat> and there you can see something that to me at least makes kind of sense. Series one is the first column that was MP1. So the sheep. Series two was MP2. The dolphin so the sheep hated the dolphin series three was the prepositional phase phrase so this will be at the library or wherever it was and then around this point in time we've got because he and we can see that for these mp1 trials it looks like people are looking more to the mp1s than the mp2s which is what we'd expect so can the same be said of the mp2 data again we can just grab it all insert an image and it looks very similar although i can see i'm just going to move this up so that we can sort of compare it to the other one actually it looks like the prepositional phase the green line is having a much more profound impact now i think that's probably because there's some strange labeling or mislabeling going on but you can also see that contrary to the prediction even in these noun phrase two biasing um <clears throat> trials people are still looking more at noun phrase one so the sheep rather than the dolphin in the example now i'm not too surprised about that this is a cut down subset of data that I chose just to illustrate some things. I wasn't actually expecting there to be any genuine effect there. But I just wanted to illustrate using these time series binning reports just how quick it is to get from what looks like an awful lot of gaze data to something that is very, very quickly going to let you then hone in and say, OK, well, look, I think we need to really narrow down into this thing so we could go back to our data for example and say well actually I want to create a new trial period a new interest period sorry which we're going to call um, I don't know sub clause 2000 and it's going to be um, SC onset but I want to go back 500 milliseconds. So I want to go from 500 milliseconds before the onset of the because he and maybe go forward two and a half seconds. So that will give us a 3000 second duration. I put that in the wrong place. I want a duration based interest period. Three seconds, which is going to be 500 milliseconds before the message that says this is the onset of the subclause. It's 3,000 millisecond long interest period, so it's going to go to 2,500 milliseconds afterwards. Um, what doesn't it like there? Cancel that. Try again. New interest period. Called subclause 2000 subclause onset make it duration based and have minus 500 
Okay, so now you can see just the subset of data from that. I should have called it 3000, shouldn't I? Um, luckily, you can edit things from that 3000 millisecond interest period. And again, whichever trial I click on, you'll now see far less data. So we could now rerun that time series binning report, and now we would have far fewer bins. And that's the kind of thing that we could then use to import into R or to whatever we want to do to use our statistics. OK, um, last. So that's time series reports. Um, the last thing I want to show you is using or sort of kind of a different way of breaking things up over time rather than binning at a sort of small level you can bin at a sort of slightly higher level by creating multiple interest periods and that I think really is one of the very very useful things that has been added to data viewer recently we go back to our faces thing if we look at the full trial period and go back to a trial look at it in this thing you'll see that we've got about um, four seconds or so of data in each trial. Now, it may be that it would be interesting to know how does gaze or how do you know what do people look at in the first 1000 or first 500 milliseconds, the second 500 milliseconds, the third 500 milliseconds. It would be nice to be able to kind of see that unfold, but not at the kind of 20 millisecond bin level, just as a sort of crude comparison of okay, well, are where people are looking in the first 20, I mean, the first second different from where they're looking in the third second, for example. And you can do that very, very easily now by creating a new interest period. We'll call it, let's call it 500, um, 500 chunk or something like that. Um, our message test is display stim. Let me just show you if I go back to the trial and look for our messages. Let's click on the messages. You'll see that there was a message display stim. So if we go back and make our 500 lock, let's call it. Um, we want to start from display stim. We want it to be 500 milliseconds long. And let's have check this little box here, create multiple consecutive IPs. Let's have eight of them. And now you can see it's immediately created for me eight of these blocks. And you will see, again, if I turn off, let's just go back to one person's data. You can see <clears throat> that depending on which block I select, You'll see different data. In fact, it's probably easiest to illustrate it like this. If we zoom out of the data in the time series view, you can see let's plot gaze. You can see this is the section. So if we look at our message, let's go to the first block, zoom out. And there's our message. There's our little message saying that's when the stimulus will show. Here you can see that. This interest period is the first 500 millisecond block. If we go to the next one, zoom back out. You can see we're now at the second block and we will move across those blocks. Now, what's really, really useful, I think, is that now if we ran an interest area report, for example, choosing dwell time and fixation count or whatever we want, we can now check this little box here create output reports for all custom interest periods and then that gives us <clears throat> two further options do we want all of those interest periods to be in one file in which case you will have a column that says this is the data from interest period one interest period two interest period three it just gives you the labels or do we want to create separate um files separate 
Excel spreadsheets for each one of those interest periods. Either one could be useful. It depends how you go about your data analysis. <clears throat> if you're the kind of person that does things in R, then you're probably going to choose this because it just becomes a variable that you can use to split things up. If you're the kind of person that does things in SPSS, you're probably going to want to use this because in general, it will allow you to then create similar sheets in SPSS, one per interest period for example it's it's purely up to you but for me this is a very very useful um, and powerful addition i just wanted to sort of point it out the last thing i'm going to talk about in this webinar is something called event editing and again i'm just going to randomly choose some data let's go back to the full trial period toggle off saccades and fixations and go and have a look at the raw data let's put saccades back on so here is an example of data unfolding over time that's what the temporal view is for let's go here we go so you can see here what looks like a very large blink yes so presumably this person wasn't set up very well and there's been an enormous blink at the end of the trial what i'm trying to find is an example where you might conceivably want to edit events now you can edit events in this kind of window by merging fixations and things but i'm not going to talk about that I'm going to find, I gave myself a little note, Pajana Theory, Trial 35. Let's go and have a look at that. Trial 35. Here's an example where, for example, here is a saccade that hasn't been parsed. It's a micro saccade. You don't expect it to be parsed, but you could imagine wanting to Let's go out a little bit say well look this wasn't one big long fixation actually it was two fixations and what I want to do is force that split basically and what you can do there's two things you can do one is you can add this little sample info which I find very useful it tells you exactly what the X and the Y value is and what the time is and even the pupil area at this point so you can sort of identify the the minima and then you can click or activate the add edit event mode which is very very useful and you can find the beginning of what looks to be that saccade if you click and drag to what looks to be the end of it whoops there it will put in or create a saccade and if we look now at how the fixations have been passed you'll see that now there's two fixations and they've got slightly different average x and y positions you can also hold down the alt key and edit events so if you find for example i'm trying to zoom in a bit um <clears throat> trying to find an example of a large post saccadic oscillation so you could see where you might want to so here's an example you could well, it's not much of an example but you may decide that actually that fixation didn't start there so you can select the saccade hold down the alt key and drag and it will not just alter the amplitude property of this saccade it will alter the duration property of the subsequent fixation and if uh, relevant the average X and Y location this is a very powerful tool and it's probably not something that's going to be of interest to many standard users but for people who work with children or who work with patient populations where you can get ambiguous data or you just need the ability to overrule <clears throat> the default parsing and say well actually no this is when I'm saying that saccade ended or this is when I'm saying here's an example of something that you might want to say what well, is that really two fixations you might want to do the opposite so you could just click on this saccade and right click and select delete and that will merge the fixation 
if you've decided that was a mistake and you should have that shouldn't have done it you can do that trick of clicking and putting the saccade back in so the ability to edit events like this is a uh, I think quite a useful one. I think coming up to half four now, at that point, I'm gonna stop it and um, stop the recording. If people do have questions, they can ask them either via GoToWebinar or you can email me. Um, I hope this has been useful. Please keep an eye out on the support forum for up and coming webinars. And if you have any suggestions for up and coming webinars or things you'd particularly be interested in hearing about, then do let us know. You can always email support at sr-research.com. Thanks for your time.